everybody. Welcome to the Female Film Critics panel. And today it's very exciting. We have with us film critic Nell Minow is here. And uh, Nell, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I was so excited. I uh, have seen your reviews for a long time and I've been wanting to connect. And uh, I, I saw that you were on my friend, uh, Jen Johans, our mutual friend, her podcast. And uh, so I reached out to her and I was just so glad that I was able to have you on and, and uh, make that connection. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this is your first time on the podcast. So I'd love you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you uh, began this journey of becoming a film critic. Okay. <laughs> it's a long journey. I've been doing yeah. this for a long time. <laughs> Uh, just to give you an idea, I this summer I reviewed a movie that was written by the grandchild of the person who wrote the first movie I ever inter- ever reviewed. Ah. So I have been doing this for a very long time. You yeah. know, I grew up in a family that was very, today we would say, media savvy. My father was the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission under President Kennedy and famously told for the first time, told the television broadcasters if they didn't do a better job, he was going to yank their licenses. And he called television a vast wasteland, which was so insulting to the television community that Sherwood Schwartz named the sinking ship on Gilligan's Island after him as an insult, the SS Minnow, of course, which we're very (laughs) proud of. Um, So I grew up in a family that was very media aware. Our our television watching back in the days when there were really only three channels. And then thanks to my father who got the legislation passed, PBS was created. He also helped create Sesame Street, presidential debate, a lot of other things we take for granted. The first telecommunications satellite he did. Anyway, so they were they taught us to be very careful about what we watched and and they didn't let us just sort of zone out in front of the TV. And I remember them saying, you know, I think Rocky and Bullwinkle is a good show for you to watch because, you know, that's written with a lot of wit and and it'll challenge you. So uh, they were not snobs, but they were thoughtful. And really, I guess I would say I began to be a critic then, um, plus being just sort of, you know, a very opinionated, snarky oldest child. So it was a good a good fit for me. I started writing movie reviews for my high school paper. Oh, wow. Uh, And uh, the New Trier News. I'm sure everyone's heard of it. Uh, And uh, the first movie I reviewed was uh, Martin Sheen's first movie. The subject was Roses. And um, I remember I turned in my review and the editor said, "Uh, you have a lot of this is kind of that and this is sort of that. You know, if you can't have opinions... You can't be a critic. And I said, do I have opinions? Yeah, I have a lot of opinions. Okay, I think this is a good fit for me. So I also wrote reviews for my college paper. Then I went to law school, did other things for a long time, had some children. And if you remember video stores, Uh I would go to the video store and uh, Hollywood Video and Blockbuster and, you know, looking for things for my kids. And I would see parents standing in front of the new releases shelf, looking like they were sinking underwater and having no idea. And I thought I got, I was very interested. The internet had just started. The World Wide web had just started. And I said, I think I could create a website. At that point, most websites were college kids or people in the military. And it was like, here's a picture of my dog. But I said, you know, I think I could start writing movie reviews again from a parent's point of view and, and provide some guidance. And at that time, there was not a single publication or corporation on the web. It was really nothing. There were hundreds of sites, not even thousands of sites. But five years later, of course, the web had happened. Yahoo, which didn't even exist when I started, was a big deal. And they called me out of the blue and said, we see that you have this archive of reviews. Would you like to be our critic? So I went from wow. being just myself in my pajamas to being myself in my pajamas as the Yahoo movie critic. By that time, I was writing my first book about movies. And when the book came out, um, I budgeted $200 to promote it. And I spent it all on a uh, list of radio stations and sent out my name to all these radio stations and said, I'd like to come on and talk about my book. And some of them said, would you like to come on every week and review movies? And I said, sure. So 
that happened. Smart. That was a good two hundred dollars. That was a good. That was a very good return on investment. Then I went <laughs> to. Um, I left Yahoo. Went to BeliefNet for about ten years, and then RogerEbert.com. So I still maintain uh-huh. my own original movie site going back to nineteen ninety five. Wow. Uh, MovieMom.com, and I'm also a contributing editor at Roger Ebert, and I also write for the move the uh, website of the uh, Motion Picture Association as well. So growing up, did you have a particular films that especially uh, inspired you that were sort of a foundation for you? Absolutely. Movies? You know, I was on a panel once of critics that were asked that question. And I noticed that, first of all, of course, all the films that we saw, we said were very good films, but all the films that we mentioned were ones that we'd seen like at age 15, 16, 17. So uh-huh. that seems to be sort of a turning point for people. Yeah. Um, obviously I, uh, you know, my parents were super great about movies and my mom would say, Hey, Hey, come, come, come in. There's this great movie called all about Eve. It's going to be on TV. I think you're going to love it. And so my parents were great about sort of pointing us to wonderful movies. But when I was uh, a teenager, um, I saw, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kid. Ah, and uh-huh. I said, this is a very, there, so there are so many decisions that go into this movie. When it goes from sepia to color, that's a decision. That's a really interesting decision. The decision to do contemporary music in a film that is set in the 19th century, that's a really interesting decision. And that's really what got me interested in uh-huh. thinking about movies and all yeah. the choices that they make and all the people that make them. And by the way, I have a daughter whose name is Rachel. And great name. And yeah. <laughs> she's a costume designer in Hollywood. Oh, nice. And I have learned so much from her. Uh, in fact, in a review that I uh, am writing today, I'm mentioning a very interesting costume choice where a character who is wearing black all through the movie, when there's a change in his life, all of a sudden he starts to wear a little bit of color. And I think, you know, that's the kind of thing we won't notice necessarily consciously, but it really helps us appreciate. Yeah what's happening and all those decisions that really interest me. Do you, do you remember the first film that you saw in the theater? You know, I don't, my father wrote a letter to my grandfather, which I have, which says Nell is four. We just took her to her first movie, uh, which was a Disney film, but I don't have a memory memory of it. Um, And it says, and now she wants to go to the movies every day. So (laughs) nothing has changed. The movie, first movie I remember seeing was also a Disney movie and it was Snow White. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. I, 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 well, they, I, they did do that, uh, 100 anniversary thing, but I wish they would, yeah. I wish they would re release like they used to in a regular. I re-release. do too. There's something about seeing them in the theater. Yeah. yeah. And seeing them with an audience. And, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I have Disney Plus. You know, I, I love to pull up the classic old, uh, animated films, but yeah, it's great to see them in a theater. Are you a fan of Rachel's reviews? Do you look forward to Family Movie Night, female film critics panels, or the Talking Disney podcast? If so, please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. As a patron, you get to access monthly events such as the watch alongs and Q&As, where you get to talk to stars and find out the behind the scenes of the movie making industry. And you can pick what I review for Family Movie Night or even become a guest on the podcast. Podcasts and YouTube channels are expensive, and I really, really could use your help. I would so appreciate it. You also get to be a member of the Facebook group where we talk about all the films that we're seeing, and we have so much fun. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies and select one of the Rachel's fan tiers. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. little, I really valued anything that I felt like was grown up. I, I I really didn't like being a kid, and, and I, I remember going to see Fantasia. Mm-hmm. And that was like a big deal. Like that was in my mind. That was that's like a, a huge a grown up. It was favorite. a grown up movie. You know, that's a huge favorite of my yeah. husband and mine. And one year, uh, as a gift, he got me, and I just cherish this so much. One of the original pencil drawings of Mickey with buckets. Oh, that's so cool. Mm-hmm. That's really really cool. Yeah. So so. What was the process for you as you sort of went from being like this blogger to being like a, a career for you? <laughs> like, it, it, did was that a, was there like a learning curve at all as far as your writing? 
No, <laughs> no. I mean, I don't kid myself that there was anything that made Yahoo reach out to me other than the two things they mentioned when they call me. One, I had an archive of 500 reviews already online. Uh -huh. And two, they liked that I was very family friendly. Right. But in terms of, of writing, I think, um, obviously, now that I've written literally thousands of reviews, I have, I hope I've gotten better uh, over time. I certainly don't say kind of sort of anymore after that first one. Um, but uh, really, I've, I was very lucky in my timing. On the other hand, I put in the work. I had 500 reviews online and then Yahoo came to me. If I, mm -hmm. you know, you just have to consider what you write as a note in a bottle and hope that somebody picks it up. Yeah. I mean, is it nice for you not being in the like LA, you know, critics going to premiere, things like that, that you don't have to deal with that, that whole part of uh, the critic landscape? Uh, well, it, that part is just that, I mean, here in Washington, where I co-founded the DC Film Critics Association, so I've been very involved in that, um, you know, there's still about, uh, about 50 of us here. Nice. So uh, it is the world's most important city, but it's not really known for its film criticism. Uh -huh. uh, to, to be in LA, and I do have a lot of friends who are in the LA area, uh, critic friends, uh, I think it would just be the the literal critical mass would be overwhelming. Yeah. But uh, I think it's hard to be a critic if you're not in a major city because we have uh, an allied office here. They set up yeah. all the screenings for us. You, I think critics normally don't go to premieres because you have to review the movie before it premieres. So yeah. you have special screenings. Yeah, I, I'm i lucky that we have that in Salt Lake as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the Utah Film Critics Association, we have a, a pretty decent little group of us. And uh, and we don't get everything, but we get like 80%, I would say, of the mm -hmm. screening. So, you know, Since certainly the enough. pandemic, you get a lot uh, by um, links. And you yeah. do lose out on what I think is very important, the theatrical experience. But yeah. Yeah, right now, in fact, w uh, as a member of the um, Critics' Choice Association, formerly the Broadcast Film Critics, I'm on the nominating committee for the documentary awards, and I'm just you know, covered in documentaries. I'm watching <laughs> like a million documentaries, but 100% of them are just sent to me at home. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what, what would you say is your favorite part about being a critic? Uh. I really like going to movies and uh, that's really my favorite part. You know, mm -hmm. the writing, I always say that they pay me for the, the writing, you know, I would yeah. go to the movies for free. Uh, it's what uh, an economist would call a sunk cost. I was already going to go to a lot of movies, so I might as well get paid for it. I think that um, the one thing I did not consider at all, which is going to sound ridiculous to you, is that when I accepted the job with Yahoo, I didn't realize I would be going to so many bad movies because <laughs> I had gone to a lot of movies over the years, but pretty much good movies. Right. And when you're a critic, you really flip that percentage and you end up, particularly at certain times of year, going to a lot of just terrible movies. Yeah. And... Um, I'm fortunate that that doesn't bother me too much, but yeah. it really took me a little while to get used to. Yeah. So I really, I really like the, all of it. I think the hardest part of it is probably, you know, finding, uh, an audience, finding, um, uh, you know, finding your own unique voice. When I started writing movie reviews online in 1995, so I'm almost 30 years into it. Wow. I had, to, you know, I grew up in Chicago, uh, I started reading Roger Ebert when he was in his 20s and I was in my teens. And that really inspired me tremendously. So it's very meaningful to me that I'm on RogerEbert.com now because everybody that's on the site is somebody that was really personally picked by him or by his widow. And, uh, but I, so I started writing reviews, but I was like, you know, I can't write just regular retail reviews. There's already a Roger Ebert. There's already a lot of people out there doing that. I have to find my own voice. And as somebody who was 
I still am a mother, but as the time I was a mother of young children, I said, okay, I see these, I go to the video store, I see these parents who have no idea what they're getting. I literally, this is probably a terrible thing to do, but I was standing in line between behind an exhausted mother who was with a, I would say, middle school boy and renting a movie that was completely inappropriate, just tons of nudity. And I just said to her, excuse me, I'm very sorry. It's fine with me if if you know what you're getting, but just right. so you know, this movie is uh, about an artist who has a lot of nude models. And she sort of looked balefully at her son like, really? You didn't tell me. And she put it back and he was ready to kill me. And I'm very sorry if you're out there listening. I'm very sorry. But, uh, but that's the thing. I just want parents to have the information. Yeah they need so they can make the decision that's right for their families. Like a lot, you know, I have two kids, one of them never been scared by anything in a movie. You could have shown him psycho at age three, he would have been fine with it. The other one is just like me. I think, you know, I'm always afraid Lassie's not going to get Timmy out of the well. I just get very scared. So you have to know your child rather than say, right. it's okay for an eight year old, tell me about your eight year old. And then I'll tell you whether it's okay. Well, I was going to ask you about that, about being the movie mom. Do you find that hard to know, like, okay, how to, what to recommend to to families? No, I just, as I said, I'm in the business of providing information. And I will tell Mm -hmm. you that when I first got started, a lot of parents would say to me, as though they had it on lock, you know, I got it all figured out. They would say, I don't care about sex. I just care about violence. Or they would say, I don't care about violence. I just care about sex. You can mm-hmm. make your own red, blue state, you know, ideas about right, right. behind that. And I would say, okay, fine. Read my site and you'll get some idea of whether this is right for you and your family. There are also a lot of issues that don't come up with the MPAA. I think we all agree that their rating system yeah. is just complete baloney. Right. And, uh, and you know, I, as I, as I, I testified before the Federal Trade Commission, it's a nice thing about being in Washington. You can do stuff like that. And that year that I testified, I said, you got Billy Elliot and Kill Bill, which both have the name Bill, both are rated. They couldn't be more different in terms right. of their appropriateness for a family. So just don't even start with me with the MPAA. But also, I mean, this this may sound trivial to some people, but Kung Fu Panda 3, I felt was very insensitive on the subject of adoption. And oh, interesting. that's not sex it's not violence it's not language it's not you know anything like that but for some families that's a really sensitive subject and you want to just alert them and say parents should know that there is an adopted child in this the main character is adopted and when he finds his bio father he's like yay bye bye old dad you know i mean you know oh i see what you're saying yeah, that that's something you're going to want to discuss if should you decide to go. You don't, you know, my motto is no bad surprises. Mm. So at least you know going in that that's going to be there and you can have yeah. a conversation about it before or after, but you shouldn't go in and get hit with that. Mm. And so I try to look for issues like that. And somebody wrote me early in my career and said, I am in a family that has had the worst tragedy imaginable, which is suicide. And if you could just flag that as an issue. um, And I said, absolutely. So I I always call that out if there's something like that Mm -hmm. in a movie. Yeah. Well, so being the movie mom, you must have had times when your kids disagreed with your takes on on movies. And they were like, what? You know? (laughs) Well, uh, I I wouldn't say so much disagreed with me. I will say two things about my son. One is that when he was about seven, he said, how old is your grandmother? And I said, she's 93. Why? And he said, I bet she can go to any movie she wants. <laughs> I said, yeah, and, and those PG nineties, they're pretty, they're pretty rough. Uh, so, you know, obviously he was That's true. <laughs> concerned. Um, but a few years later, when he was, I'm going to say, maybe 11, he he knocked on my door of my home office and came in very seriously and said, I need to see scarier movies. Mm. And I said, you know what? You've come to the right place. You happened, you know, I may not be good at a lot of things, but 
you've hit me at what my specialty. So I said, we're going to talk about all the different kinds of scary. There's jump out at you scary. There's mm -hmm. tension scary. There's gory scary. We're going to talk about all the different kinds of scary. And we're going to watch movies in all of those different categories. And we're going to work our way up to what many people consider one of the scariest movies of all time. And we did. And he was fine what's with the, it. What's the scariest uh, Psycho was the oh, one. Psycho. That, okay. The end yeah. of the journey was <laughs> was Psycho. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm so jealous. Uh, my my parents uh, don't like movies at all. Like uh, they, my my dad maybe watches maybe like two three movies a year. Like oh. my mom my mom's a reader uh, and an artist. She uh, but she's just not you know not into. They're just my parents are my parents are not like media people like mm -hmm. uh, hardly at all and and so it's just kind of random that they have this daughter who's a podcaster and, and film critic because uh i i don't know i was just not something that was really like nurtured in my home but one thing that my parents were good at is that is that they were good about always wanting to talk about what i was what I was watching, like, what did you like about it? Why did you, you know? And so that, that's so that, important. Yeah. That kind of in inspired sort of a, a critical analysis, uh, a mindset. And, and I always loved reading criticism, just like you were saying, I, you know, I, I love, I love reading. I would get Leonard Maltin's book every year, yeah. his yeah. guidebook. And I would, you know, pour over that and, and uh, so that was always just really interesting to me to hear, even if it was a movie that I would never see or never be allowed to see, it was interesting to me to hear people talk about it and what they liked, didn't like and things like that. And so, uh, but yeah, I, my parents just, they just don't get it. <laughs> But, when it comes but, to that movie. but that really, I mean, the fact is they were able to meet you on your ground yeah. and ask you the questions. That's the important part. And I'm very proud that on my movie mom site, every review I write has family discussion questions. And mm -hmm. this is what you should talk about in the car on the way home or after dinner after I love watching the movie. And, you know, sometimes people make fun of me about it. But I think those are great questions. You know, it's there's a reason going back to you know, ancient Greece, that we use stories to tell us important lessons about life. And that includes yeah. movies too. And just a simple question of, was it a mistake for this character to trust whoever they trusted? Or um, why did they make that decision? Or I used to say to my daughter, did Cinderella have other options? Did she really need to stay? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah, I think, I, I think that's, that is, so important is to take something from the movie and uh and and help you know if it doesn't challenge you if it doesn't yeah. expand you you know roger ebert used to say that movies are empathy machines mm -hmm. and you know if, if it doesn't do that then why are we watching it yeah yeah and i remember when i was in college uh i i, I went and saw Ch chocolate with a group of my friends and i didn't care for it i haven't seen it since then but i didn't like it at the time mm -hmm. and i are talking uh to them i was like oh i didn't like this and i didn't like this imagery and i didn't like blah 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 and i remember <clears throat> my friend said rachel we just wanted to watch the movie yeah <laughs> you know it, just like some people are tone deaf and some people <laughs> love music some people just want to go to the movie and forget about their troubles for a little while. And I have no problem with that. And yeah. what I would say is movies are not supposed to be spinach. You know, it's not <laughs> supposed to be eat your vegetables. If you just want to go have a good time, that is a hundred percent a great reason to go see a movie to see pretty people falling in love. Sure. Great, great reason to go to a movie. I have to tell you that I just got back a couple of weeks ago from San Diego Comic-Con, one of my favorite experiences in life. And people think, oh, Comic-Con, superheroes, zombies, aliens, and God knows there's a lot of that. And Doctor Who, you know, a lot of that. But it's really about anything that entertains people. And that is mm -hmm. why my favorite interview this year at Comic-Con was the Hallmark Christmas people. Yeah. I know who doesn't love them, right? <laughs> I'm Jewish and I love Hallmark Christmas movies. So that just shows you because frankly, they're not about Christmas. Nobody, you know, <laughs> nobody goes to church in a Hallmark Christmas movie. Yeah. You know, and right. it, that's fine. Yeah. Although this year, 
last year my favorite hallmark christmas movie was the hanukkah movie which was uh-huh. great round was and really round. good yeah. round, groundhog day at hanukkah was fantastic yeah. movie. so um I got to talk to them, and this is so fun. They're having their first reality show to pick the next Hallmark Christmas. Yeah. Home. And I didn't Chandler, even know they had a panel at San Diego Comic Con. I love they, that. I don't think yeah. they had a panel. They just had like events. Oh, and, okay, okay. And uh, so they're so some of the challenges to pick the next Hallmark Christmas hunk are rock a Christmas sweater. Yeah. Not everybody can do that. Uh, <laughs> cut down a Christmas tree and carry it home on your shoulder. Um, yeah apologizing very important Mm -hmm. uh and it's going to be such a fun show so i I can't wait whatever anybody wants to watch is fine with me i'm never going to say to you maybe with jackass or something but i no, i'm just kidding any you know anything you (laughs) want to watch you you want to watch you know freddy krueger okay yeah well it's so funny because i you know i host the hallmarkies podcast and (laughs) is that right as yeah and uh and i've had people oh i don't like hallmark movies and i'm like wait a minute and wait a minute and so i will uh i will recommend one to them i i I feel like i have the the power of hallmark matching i can find the one i'm I'm gonna tell you my favorite ones yeah and and i and it i have i have have a very successful rate here of of people that say oh i'm never gonna like that and then i i I find the right one for them and they almost always come back and say that was really charming and really sweet and and i think if you're like open to rom-coms at all they're just like any studio there's some that are good and there's you know there's some that are bad like there's just like the good ones are Good, not great. And the bad ones are not great, but not terrible. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. there was, I will say the one uh, with Brian Doyle Murray uh, who, as Santa Claus is my, probably my least favorite, but the one that I, I other than Round and Round, which I really love, yeah, I thought, really you know, good. it was wonderful. Uh, yeah. I really like one called Right Before Christmas, W-R-I-T-E, uh-huh. where she buys five okay. Hallmark cards and sends them. I love that movie. Yeah. And the one of the travel agent, the Christmas prom, the pre-Christmas, <laughs> the names are all the same, <laughs> where she makes a, a contract with someone that, that she'll go to all his Christmas events and he'll go oh, to all yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think will happen? I just <laughs> can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they're, uh, they're, who doesn't love them? They're great. Yeah. I, I certainly do. That's for sure. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's Factor Meals. Warmer, sunnier days are calling. Fuel up for them with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals in time for summer thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. Make today the day you kickstart a new healthy routine. What are you waiting for? With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. Crush your wellness goals this month with dietitian approved meals and ingredients you can trust. Make your day delicious from breakfast to dessert. Stay fueled with easy, nutritious options. Treat yourself to restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. Keep kitchen time to a minimum. Factory meals are ready in two minutes. No shopping, prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. Enjoy effortless support for your lifestyle. Choose from six menu preferences to help you manage calories, maximize protein intake, avoid meat, or simply eat well balanced. Head to factormeals.com slash hallmarkies50 and use code hallmarkies50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code hallmarkies50 at factormeals.com slash hallmarkies50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Definitely check out Factor Meals. We know you'll love them. This like obviously this horrible time with the pandemic and everything everything closing down movies all getting delayed uh it's been now four years how do you think we're rebounding or if we're rebounding at all how do you think we're still figuring it out um you know i'm concerned that the industry has not snapped back as we hoped after the strikes which i think were Mm. even more devastating than the pandemic Mm. um there have been a lot of cuts. Uh, Paramount's closing down its studio, they announced yesterday. 
Um, and my daughter tells me that uh, that only a third of the people in her union are back at work after the strike. So uh, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about that. We had such a uh, cornucopia of options for such a long time. The streamers were just spending money like crazy. And so I'm, I'm concerned about that. And I'm also concerned that, uh, I just, I really do not like reality TV. I'm going to love the Hallmark one, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but because it's nice, I don't like yeah. the meanness of right. reality. TV and the kind of insipidness. I do think writers write better dialogue than human beings do. That's why we go to movies. Um, and so uh, I think reality, there's, I think, I hope we get a pendulum swing for less reality and less bachelors and old bachelors and bachelorettes and all that and more scripted because I think, I think that's generally more entertaining and more more uh has more of a long life that you will watch it over and over yeah you know i i felt like this year has been really weak when yeah. it comes to movies i especially the mainstream i've hardly liked any of the big releases i've just been a grump mm -hmm. this year uh and i don't know how i mean how that could really be i feel like next year is when we're really gonna see the big effect of the strike as far as in content mm -hmm. yeah uh but but uh but yeah i don't know it's just been it's just it hasn't been for me most of the big releases have not been for me uh this year i i've been more finding these you know smaller small, smaller films that well I've tell me some of the ones you liked i'll tell you some of the ones that i've liked yeah so i really liked ghost light uh yeah that's a lovely movie yeah i really loved that i really loved a little uh, sci-fi movie called molly and max in the future uh that I saw it South by Southwest last year and then got a small release and uh, I really enjoyed Hitman mm -hmm. later. That was really good. Um, I will I say I, I love Glenn Powell. I, I interviewed him uh, for um, uh, Everybody Wants Some, which is still yeah. one of my favorite movies. And then I interviewed him about the Blue Angels movie that he produced this year. He's a doll mm -hmm. and I'm thrilled. Couldn't be more thrilled at how well yeah. he's doing. I He's thought so it had a strangely dark ending that. Oh yeah. Made, yeah. But, but he's great. Yeah. I really loved a little animated film called chicken for Linda. If you have the criterion channel, it's on there. I've uh, heard that's a great yeah. one. I really loved it. It's very simple. It's just this mom. She had, uh, she had accused her daughter of taking her ring and then turned out oh, that she just lost it. So she wants to make up for it. She can't cook. She All she cooks is in the microwave. And so she, but she agrees to make uh, her daughter's favorite meal, ch chicken with peppers. And so the movie is just them kind of going around the city, getting chicken, getting uh, peppers, getting all the stuff and the ingredients. And it's, it's really cute. And I love the fact that it was basically made by like two people in their apartment. Like it's like really, I mean, it's just amazing what you can do now. Uh, in, and uh the, that's not the one with cutouts is it it's uh it's a very cool like watercolor kind of aesthetic right okay yeah mm -hmm. yeah and he did the the one of the the co-directors sebastian ladenbach he did a another small movie uh called uh, a girl without hands mm. a couple of years ago anyway he's a cool artist and i, I love animation and i i, I really do too. i really I can did tell because you're a fantasia fan yes yes I really loved uh, Robot Dreams. That was, I guess, technically last year, but I, I really did love that. I thought that mm -hmm. was so, so sweet. And such a, I love friendship stories. And that was at its heart was a, you know, friendship story. But, but yeah, a lot of the bigger releases were disappointing to me. I, I was really disappointed with The Fall Guy. I was expecting to love it because, you know, I love rom-coms. And I just thought that it was, I couldn't believe that they kept them apart almost the entire movie i i was like what and uh, it was just like to me it was just like these meaningless action scenes that like i didn't care about you know i'm like why are you with why are you together like why are you separate <laughs> it's a like, different it was, movie i love uh, the i know I'm, I'm in the minority here but i love the fall guy i thought i've yeah. seen it twice and i loved it yeah. and i loved uh i loved uh sing sing that's a oh, friend i haven't story. seen that yet i missed the screening because i was out of town uh-huh well i i that was I really a want to see beautiful that. movie i loved um 
Fly Me to the Moon. That's a rom. Yeah, that was good. I liked that. I love that. That's the one, by the way, that was written by the granddaughter of the of the guy oh. who wrote the first film I ever reviewed. Oh, uh, cool. And um, have you seen Touch? That's a small. Yeah, I liked that a lot. That's a yeah, beautiful movie. That'd be up there for me. Uh, mm -hmm. That would that was really good. And I liked the way that they evolved having a set in in um, March 2020. Like that had kind of a I think a layer to the whole story. When he's in that hotel, he sort of doesn't notice that he's there all by himself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I thought that was wonderful. And I was very surprised to find first that the director, who's known for making, you know, sort of Hollywood action movies, even though he's from Iceland, that he made it because it's a very tender little story. But also that the one of the main characters is his son, who had not really acted before. And I thought, oh, really? I didn't yeah. realize that. That's, yeah, the younger the younger version of the main character is his son. Oh, in real life. Yeah, in real life. Yeah. Well, he was good. And and like <clears throat> the younger version of them, like two most beautiful people like I've seen. As I said, this year. Pretty, oh my pretty gosh. people falling in love. Number yeah. one reason to go to the movies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I. Are you, are you must be a, a Turner classic movie fan. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I love the I, I do love the classics. And it was really interesting for the pay, for my patrons I, I did, I just finished uh, in June, I finished a series where I watched the AFI 100 Passions list. Uh huh. Uh, and it took me two years to do it. Uh, every week I would watch it. And it was, it was very interesting. It's a very strange list, like what they consider passionate. But, uh, but it, nevertheless, it was a, it was a, like a, a good opportunity to, to check a whole bunch of classics off my list that I hadn't seen. And, so, uh, and which one? Much. If did any of them surprise you as being better than you thought, or worse than you thought, or different than you thought? Um, let me think. Of course, my mind has gone blank. But um, the Goodbye Girl, I had never seen that, and that was really charming. I That's thought. interesting because I think many people feel that hasn't held up well at all. Uh -huh. But uh, Marsha Mason, yeah. uh, Marsha Mason is uh, is lovely in that. Yeah, I really thought it was cute. I like the the rom com. I, of course, you know, I love it happened one night. I love yeah, the shop that's, around the corner. that's a favorite. That's one of those movies where if it's on, I'm going to just stop everything and watch it. I love Notorious. That's oh my favorite. God. Yes. <laughs> that's the best kissing scene ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, why am I not finding it? that was wrong with me? Um, the, uh, I, you know, what was interesting. It was the graduate was an interesting one because like the first time that I saw it, I was like, this is not great. Why do people love this? Like, and then watching this now that again for this series, I don't you know, I had a new appreciation for it, uh, for Mrs. Robinson as a character, uh, that I was less focused on this young romance, which I didn't don't care about as much, but and more interested in her. It's a place in the sun. That's the one I was trying to think of. I really oh, thought that was my a goodness. Good story. Yeah, that is. That is yeah. a, a that is a classic when she says, "Tell Mama, tell Mama all." It just yeah, yeah, just slays well, me because he's like obviously a horrible person, sociopath. But like it was, I thought it was really interesting the way the movie was the Shelley Winters character, like the way that they were able to make her kind of like she obviously didn't deserve. To die but like you, you kind of were like oh she's was annoying, annoying. <laughs> yeah you're sort of annoying and so like you were kind of I don't know it, just, it like took you on this journey and then you sort of realized like oh my gosh like he's like the worst and I know I just thought yeah, it was I, think, I thought it was really good yeah, yeah I like and I like Elizabeth Taylor and Giant very much too yes That's yeah amazing movie yeah, I mean, there are obviously a bunch of movies that would never be on the list today, like Manhattan. Even though I, 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 there are things I value about Manhattan, but I just don't think it would ever make the list. And and now, <laughs> well, I will say that that it bothered me when it first came out that that yeah. this, you know the the any any movie where the idea is that a young girl with no yeah. judgment is the answer to a midlife crisis is uh, really going to bother me. And, and you know, a passions when, list, like what? Yeah. <laughs> whose, whose passions are we talking about there? But uh, yeah. And, you know, they had Julie Andrews day on summer under the stars a couple of days ago on Turner classic movies. So I watched some of 10 
and which I had mm-hmm. not watched since it came out. Yeah. And I will say it's not a great movie, but in fairness to them, they really uh, turn upside down the idea that a young, beautiful, innocent woman is the answer to a midlife crisis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll just, I haven't seen that. I like. I was not that big a fan of Love Story. Yeah. I didn't think that was that great. And they have that in the top 10. Yeah, of course. Um, I love Moonstruck. That's favorite. That uh, could could not be a better movie than Moonstruck. Yeah. I can't even count the number of times I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of my favorites. And of course, I love Singing in the Rain. I'm a big musical apologist. I, I I'm love very, I'm very forgiving of musicals. <laughs> I, me too. Listen, uh, you know, you can't be a bigger apologist for musicals than I'm kind of a fan of At Long Last Love, which everybody hates. But uh, I, I also am a huge musical fan. And yeah. I think... Everybody should see uh, Bells Are Ringing, for one. That's oh, I love Bells Are Ringing. I love Bells Are Ringing. Yeah, me too. I love that too. Um, but yeah, uh, compl- like I I was not that impressed with Out of Africa. Like it looks pretty, but I was just kind of like, eh. I agree. I, I didn't love that. I would recommend that somebody just read Isaac Dennison's books and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Also, I thought like they had some weird choices, like having Vertigo on the list. I thought it was like, I don't think of that as like a passionate movie. Well, it, you know, there's a fine line between passion and obsession. I sound like a perfume commercial right now. But yeah, I think I think that one falls more into the area of obsession. I am not a fan of Vertigo. I, I'm a huge Hitchcock fan. I love Hitchcock. But the idea that Vertigo was on the sight and sound list as the number one film of all time is yeah. to me. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I, you know, I love Hitchcock, but that, that is not even in my top 10 of Hitchcock. Yeah. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies merch store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable Hardy or Hallmarkie in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies merch store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller Carrie from Walmart Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. Interesting experience. So over the years, you you must have had like some unpopular opinions, like movies that people love that you just didn't love or, or movies that, that uh, you yeah. were saying one that people hate that you love. Uh, what's that experience? What what's what's a good example for you of that, and and what's that experience like, especially online? Well, in that category, I would say there are two. There are ones, and in both of them, I feel that um, everyone will come around to my way of thinking <laughs> at some point. Uh-huh. I mean, for example, if I uh, one of the movies that I hate the most in the entire world happened to win a couple of Oscars, including Best Picture, oh. and that. Was, a uh, million dollar baby. I cannot tell you how much I hate that movie. I hate everything about it except okay. for Morgan Freeman. Uh-huh. I hate Forrest Gump, which also got the Oscar for Best Picture. And again, uh-huh. I think the world will catch up to me in a hundred years from now. People will <laughs> see that those are not very good movies. Yeah. Um, and then there are movies that I think the world will come around to appreciating more as we see. I mean, for example, yeah. some just sent me something this morning about how Shawshank Redemption was a big flop when it came out uh-huh. and even now has not made a ton of money and yet it's just generally accepted as a classic. Yeah. And I mean, Moby Dick was not a huge hit when it came out. I mean, the book. And yeah, yeah. until like 70 or 80 years later that people went, wow, this is a really important book. We should probably put it on the curriculum of yeah. every school. So yeah, for, for me, as far as Oscar winners that yeah. I had the contract for me, it was uh Birdman. I just really yeah, disliked yeah, that, that movie. That was a I think that that first of all, I never confuse Oscar winners with any kind of absolute or objective right. standard of quality. Absolutely. Those are those are awards made by the industry to the industry. Yeah. And I think they all appreciated kind of the audacity of that movie. They did, you know, one long shot. But uh, 
but yeah, I, yeah, I had no problem with the cinematography win the the whole movie. Yeah. Just I really disliked. And yeah. then I think pretty much people have come around to my view on American Beauty. I really hated that it came out. Yeah, and- I really didn't like American Beauty. I thought it was yeah. very pretentious. Oh yeah, Gotta have and the, the floating plastic the bag, floating plastic you know? bag. Oh my god, I thought it had a very adolescent point of view. So I yeah. totally agree with you about that. What's a movie that you like that nobody likes that that you think they will like? Someday? Well, I mean, there's a lot of musicals that I'm in. Yeah, like what? <laughs> that, um, well, just not, not like, paint I, your wagon, probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I liked I, something like The Prom. I know it wasn't perfect, but uh, but I thought it was overall very sweet. And um again just off the top of my head uh that would be one that i thought was very sweet and i enjoyed uh and so that's you know kind of wild i i like dear evan hansen which most people hated so yeah. i am a very forgiving when it comes to musicals that's fine i i have yeah. i know another critic who's also equally forgiving on musicals <laughs> yeah i did not like dear evan hansen it was flawed a lot of re- but i didn't like the play so i was already yeah. you know not a fan i the, the whole idea of it really bothered me um there are movies like waking life that i think is a uh, great great movie that not enough people have seen and appreciated yeah, that's a good one. Uh, i heart huckabees i really like a movie that takes a big swing you know i like mm-hmm. a movie that just grabs and says i'm going to address the big existential issues and mm-hmm. i'm going to do it in an interesting way and i think um uh, Stranger Than Fiction is another oh, one that I, I love. That's a great, great movie. I love that movie. And when he brings her the flowers. When he brings her the flowers, oh, it's the best. Yes. I know. I know. And he sings that song to her. Oh, my God. It's a great, great movie. <laughs> uh, I, you know, my sister used to be the dean of the Harvard Law School. She still teaches there and her husband teaches there. And she and I were just talking about that movie because it's her daughter's favorite movie. And I said, but you know, Maggie Gyllenhaal went to Harvard Law School in that movie. She said, she dropped out. I said, yes, she, you know, her character did drop out. <laughs> so yeah, but that's a great, great movie. So I really feel that one of the core responsibilities of a movie critic is to bring to the attention of the audience movies they might otherwise overlook. You know, nobody needs to tell me to tell them whether to go see twisters or not they know whether they're going to go to twisters right uh or or deadpool they know whether they're going to go um i'm not there for that i am there to say touch is a really interesting movie and very well done and this is one that i i really think is worth your time yeah i agree and i love when you can find that little movie that in that I can kind of champion something like chicken for Linda, you know, that maybe people haven't heard of. And like within my little sphere of influence, there was, there was a movie that was, it was on, it wasn't even on Hallmark. It was on up TV, this little uh, rom-com called mixed baggage that Mm -hmm. I just absolutely loved last year uh, that within like my little rom-com bubble of friends, like I got a ton of people to watch it. And I just thought it was so well written and so well done and and on my podcast i had the writer on i had actors and i just love when you can do that when you because because especially tv movies like they never get any like real you know like respect unless it's on you know hbo or something and uh and it's it's nice to be able to say to people like i i really did value what you did there Yes, a hundred percent. And uh, you know, as That's I said, the best part of being a critic. what we do is a note in a bottle, but what they do is a note in a bottle too. They're they're just putting their hearts out into the world and hoping somebody mm-hmm. will see it and yeah. and appreciate it. And they're I think that's one of the reasons people do like Hallmark movies. It's not because they're formulaic, it's because they really do put their hearts into it. They yeah. really care they are lovely people and they love their fans yeah it's true i mean they are way more accessible than uh, than other uh other genres and you know like i when i when i've tried to get interviews and things like that like i mean granted i have you know it's, it's the most popular thing i do with the hallmark podcast but still like i i when i've tried other places there's something about that hallmark community that's very very like welcoming and very uh, open to that, which I really appreciate. But uh, but yeah, it does feel good when you can kind of 
like, cause so much of being a critic is about critiquing. Right. So it, it does feel good when you can be like, when you can turn into a champion. A cheerleader. Absolutely. Yeah. A cheerleader. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. love that. that. I, I love doing that because we do get to see a lot of things mm. that other people might overlook. And-, well, and it's so exciting when you leave a movie screening yeah. and you just think, Oh my gosh, this is great. This is, uh, I, I remember when I saw it at Sundance, when I saw Sing Street for the first time. Oh my gosh. I love that movie so <laughs> deeply. So and he's got a new movie coming out and I cannot wait. Yeah. <laughs> I love everything he does. Yeah. You know, Roger Ebert started a festival that he called the overlooked film festival. That was uh-huh. nothing but movies that he felt deserve more attention. And the filmmakers didn't like that name. So they changed it to Ebert Fest, but we have uh-huh. that every year in Illinois in the spring. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. I'm there every year because they're all movies that are empathy machines. They're all, and we, last year we had, among other things, um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is one of my favorites. And uh-huh. Just to see that again on that gorgeous big screen, you know, they've got one of those theaters that was built in the early 20th century that's like a cathedral of movies and fabulous sound system, fabulous screen. And just to be there. And the other thing about Ebert Fest that's wonderful is that unlike other film festivals where you're constantly sort of FOMOing, what did you see that I, you know, I get in, whatever. Everybody goes to the same movie together. And over the course of the four days, it just builds up sense to sense of community yeah. and shared experience. It's just fabulous. So I highly recommend Ebert Fest. Oh, that's cool. When when is that? Uh, it's in here? April, usually in, April, in okay. uh, Champaign Urbana, Illinois, which is where the University of Illinois is. On the yeah, campus. that's nice. If they have like a, a mixture of new and classics. Yes, it's mostly you know, classics, but well, as I said, it's also films. In fact, I recommend a touch, and I think they're going to try to put that on oh, the cool. on the schedule for next year. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's and and they have filmmakers there to talk about them. We yeah. had one film that it, uh, this year that I helped present that isn't even out yet called Albany Road. Oh, uh, cool. That that was just uh, one of those movies where. <laughs> Two people who don't like each other are stuck driving across country together. Oh. You know what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is a fun romance. experience going to a festival because it's also, I love just like talking to people in line, you know, mm-hmm. saying, Oh, what did you see? What, what did you like? What did you, and, uh, and then, and then just talking about movies. So it's just like, you find your hive kind of. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what Comic-Con is like. You find, mm. you find your tribe. Your tribe of people who really love stuff. And everybody there, it is literally the happiest place I've ever been. Everybody's happy to be there. Everybody is happy for you that you're there to see Doctor Who. They're there to see yeah. Pokemon, whatever. Everybody's just right. happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I've been to our local fan X that we have here in Salt Lake, but uh, I haven't I haven't been to Comic-Con. I've been to D23 a couple times. I would like yeah. to try D23. Yeah. I had a was there this week and had a lot of fun. Yeah, well, I heard that they it was much better this mm-hmm. year. It's it 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 it's a I had a very love hate relationship with T twenty three, but uh, but I heard that they made a lot of improvements this last one. So oh, I'll I'm to, glad to hear it. Uh, yeah, I'll have to go to the the in the next two years, but uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I go to Sundance every year, obviously because uh, that's right, right there. Here. I've only been yeah. once, and I was in the film. I wasn't there as a critic. I was oh, really? in a documentary and I was there with the documentary. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I've been to New York Film Festival uh, mm-hmm. three times. I applied. So hopefully I'll be able to go again this year. And and uh, and then I've been to Animations Film, which is a really special little uh, festival uh, in Los Angeles. They have it at the Chinese Theater. And uh, it's very well done. They have great panels. Uh, and it was nice. That was a fun festival to go to uh, post pandemic because most of those animated films were being just put into streaming. So it was really one of the only ways that you could see these movies uh, that, you know, on the big screen. You know, it was uh, like I saw Luca there and I saw, which mm. you know, now they've. Luca re- is it? I, I'm not, I have some issues with the storyline, but it is a beautiful film. Yeah. I really, I, I really enjoy it. I, I, again, I love, I love friendship stories. So 
Uh, so that, that one worked for me quite well. Uh, but it was neat. Uh, we got to watch Belle, which I loved the, mm-hmm. that movie Belle by Homer, Homer Hasada. And uh, he was there oh, mm-hmm. and he, uh, he like introduced it and everything. I was talking about it. And it was one of the first post pandemic movies that I saw with like a full theater. Uh, yeah. Aside from uh, No Way Home. That was probably, be, that was probably the first first, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway it was cool so yeah those experiences because i've heard people say like why do you care like you just you're just you're just spending all this money to watch a movie a couple months before it you know comes out it's not really about that it's about like the panels it's about scenes like getting excited about something and seeing it early uh, a chance to interact with the filmmakers yeah just wonderful yeah 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 i agree well, very good. You did. You answered all the questions. And uh, thank you so much for coming on talk with us. This was a, a real treat for me uh, to talk with you. And I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you very, very much for your very thoughtful questions and for inviting me on. Well, if people want to follow you and everything that you do, how do they how do they do that? Uh, well, uh, you can come to moviemom.com. You can also see me at Roger Ebert, find me on Rotten Tomatoes. And if you're in one of the cities where I'm on the radio, you can listen to me every week. Oh, very good. Yeah. What, um, uh, what, uh, channels are, where, where are you broadcasting? It's all on the website. It says where, okay. where you can be. Good. Great. Well, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to now for coming on. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed our discussion. Hope you all did as well. Make sure you're following all of her content and make sure you check out all of our episodes of Female Film Critics panel in the playlist that I have in the description. And uh, you can follow me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. And make sure you're following the Hallmarkers podcast as well, everything I've got going on there. And uh, if you are listening on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. Really appreciate that. If you are watching YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Appreciate that so much. We also have the Patreon group, which is the biggest way you can support and you can be part of exclusive content. Like when I was watching the AFI passions list and also check out the merch store uh, for lots of fun designs. And again, thanks to now really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you later. Bye.